Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at David the Fugitive, 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. Back in chapter 19 in verse 1, we saw David fleeing from the presence of Saul when Saul tried to kill him. Uh, then he was assisted by Michal, his wife. He was assisted by the Lord. And in chapter 20 and verse 1, uh, he and Jonathan make a covenant. So all of Saul's family is on David's side. Now we see that he's also going to be assisted by Ahimelech, the high priest of Israel. Chapter 21, verse 1, Then David came to Nob, um, to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? It, it looks just a touch suspicious. Uh, you usually see David in the in the company of the king or in the company of, of soldiers, as we're going, going to see. He's not by himself. Verse 2, David said to him, elect the, the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, Let no one know anything about the matter on which I'm sending you and with which I have commissioned you. And I have directed the young men to a certain place. These young men are with David. He's, he's accompanied by some men. And he tells Ahimelech, I'm on a secret mission. I guess it's so secret that even Saul doesn't know about it. Uh, verse 3, now therefore, he says, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. Verse 4, the priest answered David and said, there is no ordinary bread, no regular bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. There, there would be bread that would be placed on the table of the bread of the presence that would be inside the tabernacle. And Ahimelech answers, if only the young men have kept themselves from women. In other words, uh, it's not that women are bad or anything like that, but it's saying they have to be they have to be ceremonially pure. There can be no ceremonial impurity for them to eat this because that which is in the, in the temple has to, be, has to be ceremonially pure. Verse 5, David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out, uh, and the vessels of the young men were holy, not because of that they were planning on coming here to the tabernacle. Uh, notice he says, though it was an ordinary journey, but it just worked out that way. And then he goes on to say, how much more than today will their vessels be that way, be holy? Um, so uh, they just happen to be pure. Uh, it just happens to be the case. Verse 6, so the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord. What they would do is they would, uh, every so often, uh, you don't want the bread going stale or moldy that's in the tabernacle. So every so often they replace it with fresher bread, and then the bread that's been there now becomes that which the high priest and the other priests will eat because they are ceremonially pure. And so uh, notice uh, they would take this in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Uh, and as they would rotate it, they would be allowed to eat that bread. And that bread is now given to David and his men to eat. By the way, Jesus makes a point of pointing out this passage saying that need trumps ritual. Remember that, that uh, there were times when the disciples of Jesus, maybe they were going through a grain field and nobody had eaten breakfast that day, and they grabbed a little handful of grain and they popped it in their mouth and they ate it. And Jesus said, that's okay. After all, the precedent was set way back here in the book of First Samuel. Now, verse 7, now one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite the chief of Saul's shepherds. And that's going to be a bad thing. This this person from Edom, he's not an Israelite, he's an Edomite, but he's working for Saul. Verse 8, David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? After all, there's not. Uh, Israel didn't have an abundance of weapons on at that time. And he adds, For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Remember, he had to, he had to leave the palace in a hurry, or the palace, the house of Saul at least, uh, in a hurry because Saul had tried to kill him, kill him. He doesn't have a weapon. He asks, Is there a weapon available? Verse 9, then the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. It's sort of a, a, a trophy that's being 
been held here at the tabernacle. He says, if you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. That's the only weapon that's available. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. And so he takes the sword of Goliath. Verse 10, then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. So he leaves Nod. Now he's going to go to Philistine territory. Um, notice there are five cities down along the along the coast. There's Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and Gath. That's one of those five cities of the Philistines, the five key cities. Verse 11, but the servants of Achish said to him, is this not David, the king of the land? Um, did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And if they were singing that David slew his ten thousands, then he must be the big king. Um, of course, they're, they're not up on all of their, their information. David is not a king. He's on the outs with the king. But they had been singing that song. Verse 12, David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath, so he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands. Now, David's not really insane. He's just acting the part. He's acting with wisdom. He's acting uh, in an intelligent way. But he acts insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. He acts the part of a crazy person. And as a result... Verse 14, as a result, then Akish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman? Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Uh, that's all I need is another crazy person. Shall this one come into my house? Absolutely not. So chapter 22, verse 1, so David departed in, in one piece, as I might add. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. So he comes back to Israelite territory up in the Shephelah, uh, right near the mountains. And he comes to Adullam uh, and the cave of Adullam. Verse, one, uh, verse 2, everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. And then it's almost by way of a footnote. Now, there were about 400 men with him. We're going to see that number rise. But notice how David is becoming the refuge to those in need. I think this is actually the pivotal point in this entire section. Verse 3, and David went from there to Mitzbah of Moab. Mitzbah is like a, a fortress. Um, and, and so a lot of places uh, with that name. Uh, but he's going to Moab and he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Now you say Moab, wasn't, wasn't Moab an enemy of Israel? But remember, uh, David's family, Ruth, his ancestor had been from Moab. So there's sort of a family connection there. Verse 4, then he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Now that word stronghold, the way you say that in Hebrew, it's in the Masada. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm not saying that was necessarily the place that we call Masada today, but it's the same word and might be, might be the same place. So we had, you know, uh, David fleeing the presence of Saul, he assisted by, assisted by Saul's uh, family. We had uh, David and Jonathan make a covenant. He's been assisted by Ahimelech. Now we're going to see, he, he's, he fled to Gath, but now we're going to see that he's assisted by the king of Moab. Verse 5, the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So uh, we've gone from Achish to Moab to now the forest of Hereth. Verse 6, then Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was sitting in Gibeah, that's Saul's hometown. Uh, he was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. That spear has already uh, taken a couple swings at David. And all his servants were standing around him. Verse 7, Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse all give to all of you fields and vineyards? You know, I've been paying you off. I've been going doing special favors. Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds like I am doing? 
Verse 8, for all of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there's none of you who's sorry for me who discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. David wasn't lying in, in ambush. What you see is Saul becoming paranoid. He thinks that everyone is out to get him. And that's not the case. Nobody is out to get him. Verse 9, then Doeg, the Edomite, notice he's going to play into that, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab. Uh, he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine, all of which is true, but notice Doeg is sort of ratting out the high priest. Now, I want you to see the, the structure of this section here, because what we started with was Ahimelech. He had helped David, not realizing that David was on the run, um, but he had been seen by Doeg the Edomite. Then we had David fleeing to Gath. We had his family joining him at Adullam. And what I suggested was the pivotal point where everyone who is in distress, debt, or bitter comes and joins David. David has become a refuge to the people in the middle of him being a fugitive. Uh, next, we saw his family again, where he takes his family to Moab. We see him uh, fleeing to the forest of Hereth. And now we come full circle because now we're going to see Ahimelech confronted by Saul and he will be murdered by Doeg the Edomite. Verse 11, then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech the priest and the son of uh, Ahimelech the son of the priest, the son of Ahitab, and all his father's household, the priests who were in Nob, and all of them came to the king. So it's not just Ahimelech, it's the entire priesthood who's on duty come to before Saul. Verse 12, Saul said, listen now, son of Ahitub, and he answered, Here I am, my Lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day? Well, Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David? I mean, wait a second. I haven't been brought to, up to speed on any of the happenings. As far as I know, David is the faithful one. He is uh, he's the king's son-in-law. He's captain over your guard. He's honored in your house. Um, did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? This isn't something new. I've been doing this all along. Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. I, he is, Ahimelech is pleading ignorance, and he really is ignorant. He really doesn't know that Saul thinks that David is conspiring against him because it's all taking place only in Saul's mind. Verse 16, but the king said, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and your father's household. Verse 17, and the king said to the guards who were attending him, turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death because their hand is with David and because they knew that he was slain and did not reveal it to me. But, and to their credit, the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hand to attack the priests of the Lord. After all, they're priests of the Lord, and they fear God. Verse 18, then the king said to Doeg, you turn around and attack the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests, and he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He kills, murders the priests of God. Verse 19, and he struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants, also ox and donkeys and sheep, and he struck with the edge of the sword. And I can't help but think that this reminds me of another town that was struck by the enemy of the anointed one. It was Herod who sent men to go down and strike not every man, woman, and child, but all the, all the children, all the young children in Bethlehem. And, and here is, an, here is uh, the event that would turn into an echo of that in the New Testament. Verse 20, but one son of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, uh, this son was named Abiathar, he escaped and fled after David. Verse 21, Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord 
Then David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have brought about the death of every person in your in your father's household. Hadn't been that David had did it, done it willingly or purposefully, but David, notice, takes responsibility. And now he says to Abiathar, stay with me, do not be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, and you're safe with me. And so David becomes a refuge even to the to the next high priest. Now, this whole story reminds us, and it's supposed to remind us, of a psalm. Psalm chapter 52 and verse 1 starts off in the in the uh, beginning, sort of the introduction of the psalm, the what we call the superscription. It starts off for the choir director, a maskil of David, when Doeg the Edomite came and told Saul and said to him, David has come to the house of Ahimelech. Those, that superscription was not something added by the translators that is in our oldest copy of Psalm 52. And now the psalm itself begins, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The loving kindness of God endures all day long. Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. Doeg is that worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. Selah. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. Have you ever known someone like that, that just runs after evil? Verse 5, but God will break you down forever. He will snatch you up and tear you away from your tent and uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. It's a reminder that the story isn't over yet. Verse 6, the righteous will see and fear and will laugh at him, saying, Behold, the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and was strong in his evil desire. Here's the question before the house. Are you making God your refuge? Those people that came to, to David, they were seeking refuge. We have one that is greater than David, the, the greater son of David, and he calls us to come and make him our refuge. Verse 8, but as for me, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the loving kindness of God forever and ever. I will give you thanks forever because you have done it, and I will wait on your name for it is good in the presence of your godly ones. Have you come to the place where you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for you? Have you found refuge in under his wings? Have you found refuge at his cross? If you have, then you can wait on his name because it is good. You can be in the presence of the godly ones.